All right. Welcome, everyone, to the colloquium. So I think we are ready to start. Uh, I'm happy to have uh, here today uh, Professor uh, Stefano Carrazza, who is, uh, so actually, I guess the, the, the most important thing I learned today, and I was surprised, is that he's uh, a true Paulistano. I know, I guess, uh, I know if uh, being born here is sufficient to earn this title, or you need something more than that, but uh, um, it turns out that his story is more, more complicated, but uh, he started here <laughs> in some sense. Um, so he's uh, actually, um, so uh, since last year, I think, uh, he's uh, been at the University of Milan. Yeah. And before this, uh, he was a fellow at uh, CERN, and he still uh, keeps a, a connection with CERN. And so he's going to tell us today about uh, machine learning applied to theoretical energy physics. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so... Thank you, Eduardo, for the presentation. And uh, today I have prepared uh, this talk about machine learning applied to high energy physics. Uh, at the University of Milan, we have this project, which is called uh, N3PDF. And we, the aim of this project is to combine machine learning with physics. So try to find all the possible methods that can be imported from the, the, this set of tools into into particle physics, in particular, theoretical high energy physics. Yeah, so preparing this talk is a little bit complicated, in particular if you, if you are theoretical physicists, because you have to motivate, you know, what is machine learning, why we are talking about machine learning. So why talk about machine learning? Well, today we have essentially uh, machine learning everywhere, in particular in uh, experimental physics, and also in many applications in the real world. Machine learning is a set of algorithms uh, that are used for building models in science. Um, and you see a lot of interests from the experimental and theoretical community. For example, if you look at CERN, we have uh, uh, conferences, we have um, workshops, working groups, grants based on that. So trying to boost the, our field using these machine learning techniques. The second question is, when apply machine learning in theoretical physics? because by definition we try as theoretical physicists to have models where the interpretability are very high. You know, so we understand what's going on in our project. And we don't like to have black boxes. But there are a couple of examples where machine learning is really relevant. For example, in situations where there is an ambiguous choice, so you don't know what to do, so you have to check what's the best solution for your system. Or in situations where there is a lack of information. So I don't know how to complete this information, so I don't have a, a perturbative calculation or I don't have some theoretical argument to make a choice. So then I, I can uh, try and apply machine learning. Okay? So these are the main two situations where machine learning is fully motivated. So for this talk, I have it divided into two parts. I will start talking about machine learning. I will give you a homogeneous, let's say, a, introduction to machine learning, so you understand what we are talking about, what are the main difficulties. And then uh, I will go for a second part where examples in uh, theoretical physics and, and in particular in uh, HEP TH, uh, successful applications where machine learning is, is really uh, a game changer. Okay. Please, if you have questions, just interrupt me during, uh, during the talk. So, artificial intelligence. Many people talk about in artificial intelligence uh, but in, pra in practice, uh, AI started in the 50s with some uh, theoretical experiments, like the Turing machine, so a machine which was able to write text and uh, try to fake the behavior of a human uh, discriminator. And then in this, uh, from the 50s to the 80s, we had a lot of papers trying to explain how to code a machine uh, in order to be, let's say, intelligent. From the 80s, we cross the border and we change the name of these uh, uh, computer science tools into machine learning because now we have extremely uh, interesting computers. So you have computers in, uh, that can make calculations where you can program and um, so things are getting more and more popular. And one of the main examples uh, is the IBM uh, Deep Blue, which plays chess. You know, was one of the first uh, uh, great results of machine learning. And finally, in these last 10 years, 
we have the famous deep learning period. And in the deep learning, uh, models get bigger and bigger, and you have systems to learn more and more complex systems, okay? So when someone tell you AI, I say my product has an AI, they can really mean something that uh, contains information from the 50s to, to ours today. So machine learning is uh, used in many fields today. So for, nat for example, natural language pro processing, uh, computer vision, speech, uh, planning, robotics. So it's really, we are really surrounded by these uh, systems. Uh, it's a system where we have a, um, a learning mechanism which is associated. Now, from a more theoretical point of view, we can uh, define two families of tasks when trying to construct a model. No? We have tasks which are abstract and formal, for example, playing chess. So for us, as human beings, it's hard to play chess because you need to understand what's going on, you have a set of rules. But from a machine perspective, it's not so difficult because you can uh, test different games, you can compute probabilities, so you can have a representation which is called knowledge-based approach. Right? So it's something that you can code. And this was one of the first applications of machine learning. The second family of tasks are the ones which are very intuitive for humans, but hard to describe formally. So if you think, if I show you this plot with numbers or pictures with cars, for us, it is very easy to capture the concept so we know that these are cars, even if you, don't, you never see before a, a Jaguar, for example. While for a machine, this is very hard. Right? So people in uh, the, com the computer science community, they start thinking, well, how can we solve this issue? How can we capture the concept? And one of the solutions proposed in the, in the 80s, 90s, was to propagate the knowledge-based approach, apply some human supervision, and hard code logical inference rules. So just try the brute force knowledge based approach, plug more information in, and hope that this would work. But unfortunately, uh, we had a lot of lacks in, in terms of representation. So it was very, very difficult to do it. So the solution was really to forget about the knowledge based approach and program a system in such a way that a model is automatically learned from data or from the information that you'd like to learn. And this takes the name of machine learning. OK, so now moving to uh, machine learning more specifically. Uh, we have two definitions. Uh, the most formal definition is from the 1998. Uh, we call machine learning a computer program uh, that learns from an experience that we call E with respect to some task by looking at a performance measure. So you have uh, something that will try to push down the performance, so increase the quality of your model, by uh, looking at the information that you feed in, so the experiment E. Okay. Uh, by doing that, we have many uh, day life applications. For example, you can uh, think about uh, medicine, so you have, for example, lesions alert in nature a couple of years ago, so people can detect uh, lesions in a, in a, for, for a for applications in medicine. We have a database mining. We have, um, uh, for example, the search engines, spam filters, everything that we use in uh, our daily life. Uh, we have also applications uh, concerning intuitive tasks for humans, like uh, autonomous driving, natural language processing, game playing. For example, here you have a paper from Nature talking about the deep Q networks. We have, for, finally, also applications involving human learning. For example, try to capture con uh, concepts, try to apply product recommendations. So all that is uh, probably today, if you look around, uh, we are surrounded by that, no? by, by products from Google, from Apple, from all these, uh, these big uh, guys. Now, from our point of view, we have also a lot of applications in, uh, in, in physics, in particular in high energy physics. Uh, the most famous ones are in the experimental field. Uh, we have, uh, for example, signal and background detection by using decision trees, uh, artificial neural networks, uh, support vector machines. We have uh, techniques for jet discrimination where we use deep learning. Yes? So what's yes. the definition of learning? The one that we had yeah. Yeah. Is it supervised or not? Are you allowed to tell 
tell the computer to give it correction, or is it just intuitively experience and just receive the data and somehow you don't? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I will talk about that. There are three families. They supervise it and supervise it and reinforce it. No? This definition was at the time of uh, supervise it. No? So you use the performance by comparing the true with the model prediction. Yeah. But you go, in the next slide, I'll go through that. Yeah, so in, in experimental physics, we'll uh, have a lot of applications. And these applications are very important because they boost the speed and the quality of our predictions. So if you think about the Higgs discovery, here you have machine learning. If you think about the discrimination between a uh, jet from a gluon or a quark, again, we have uh, convolution of neural networks. If you think about the detector simulation, you can use the generative models. So there are a lot of progress. But it's also true for theoretical physics. Even if we are not so popular as the experimentalists, we have applications of supervised learning and supervised learning. And uh, you talk about some of these examples in the, in the second part. Okay. So just to complete the panorama of uh, machine learning applications, um, it's true we have um, at least three main uh, concepts or ways to apply machine learning. The first one is the supervised learning. So we can do a regression or a classification. It's a system where uh, I have a supervisor, the supervisor trains a model and then compares the model predictions to some input data set or to the desired output. Okay. So in this case, for example, if I have this plot with two families of points, I would like to reproduce the cluster location, but I know the answer. So I'd like to train a model that is able to generate clusters based on my desired output. And this is very common, so we do, in, for example, even if you think about a linear regression, we are in this context. The second family of algorithms is the unsupervised learning. So in this system, we don't know we, what is the truth, so we don't know what we are doing in particular, so we have to discover using these techniques. And uh, uh, for example, I can give you the same uh, situation as before, but now I don't have any more the, 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 the crosses and the dots, so I have dots everywhere. But I, for example, can ask uh, how many clusters or how many features are inside of this data. Uh, how, how can I create a catalog of features? And this is what we do with unsupervised learning. So we do clustering, dimensionality reduction. For example, if you are familiar with principal component analysis, we can do nonlinear PCA. And in this case, we will do dimensionality reduction based on autoencoders and systems which are more, uh, more complicated. And finally, we have this third uh, category of applications, which, is, uh, which are very new, I mean, at least for, let's say, for important applications, uh, is the reinforcement learning. So in this system, you have the environment and an agent. The agent will try to do a step and will wait for feedback from the environment. Okay? And the simplest example is a game plane. So if you show an Atari game like this one, uh, you have a joystick, you can move the joystick and measure the score of your game. So you can train a model that will learn how to play this game and be very clever. For example, here you see the final game of this training. Uh, he starts uh, destroying the sides of the, the plots. And then after some time, in the plot number four, the ball crosses the border. And uh, going up, he can queue and uh, get a lot of score very, very quickly. Right? And this mechanism is called the reinforcement learning. So you have an agent, so a joystick uh, that is controlled by a model, and the environment, which is the score of the game. Okay. So it's very useful for real-time decision for uh, when, we, when you need to learn some underlying mechanism which requires feedback from previous operations. So when you have a, an episode of changes with correlations. Yeah. But obviously, these are only three. In practice, we have many, many applications of machine learning. We are talking about more than 60 algorithms today. And it can be applied to many different problems. Okay. OK. Now, let's just go one step further and talk about the models and metrics and what are the issues of doing or using these techniques. Uh, when we implement a machine learning algorithm, usually you follow this uh, work, uh, workflow. We have data, we have a, mo a model, we have a cost function, an optimizer, and you put all these things together into a training. After the training, we can generate a best model. So you have a final model that we would like to use for inference, no? to check its performance. 
simple example, linear regression. This is already an example of doing, uh, building a model, training on data. What are the limitations? Is that we are locked by the linearities. No? So if I, get, I, I give you some data which is distributed in this way, you can do a linear fit. If you would like, you can also do a generalized linear model and try a polynomial fit, quadratic. But we are bounded by this uh, set of, uh, by this family of models, linear models. One solution is to try nonlinear models, like neural networks. Yeah. Now, what is the problem of doing this or following this pattern? Is that we automatically, by increasing the flexibility of our model, we lose interpretability. So we can gain an accuracy. So if you take a linear regression, this plot, you see that the accuracy is low, but the interpretability is high because you can uh, build the system back. But as soon as you go to neural networks, you increase the accuracy a lot, but you lose interpretability. Yeah. So this is one of the trade-offs of machine learning. If you need accuracy, then you lose uh, your, let's say, way to explain what is going on. The second uh, point is that as soon as you have the flexibility to select the best capacity of your model, you can get trapped into situations where the data is uh, underfitted. So you select the bad op optimal size of your model. So you, for example, instead of using a, some of, sort of polynomial, you are fitting with a straight line in the left case. Or if you, are, if you get a model with a lot of flexibility, then you fall in the category of overfitting. So your model really passes through points, oscillates, and reproduces the noise. So it's really difficult to find the appropriate capacity. So how can uh, we deal with these problems? Well, usually you define metrics or, or statistical estimators that will measure the model performance. You know? So we define the cost, loss functions, error functions. And an example, for example, uh, here, you can uh, define a quantity that I call J omega, where J, J is the loss, so it's a metric uh, that I would like to minimize and the omegas are the weights of my model. So from a technical perspective, I would like just to find the best set of um, weights uh, of my model where the J function is at the minimum. Yeah. So if you think about the mean square error, where I'm comparing the model prediction to the model, uh, to, to, the, to the, the real observable quantity, I can build things which are quadratic functions and convex functions, so I know that I'm getting really the best value for, for my system. Yeah. So following this, uh, this idea, in machine learning, as soon as you have defined a model, you go through the loss function and you try to minimize this loss function. Yeah. And there are, in uh, practice, at least three algorithms for doing that. So we can uh, use normal equations, least squares, which are okay, at least for, for generalized linear models. We can use derivative-based optimization. So we can compute the gradients of my loss function, the Hessian of my loss function. And we have evolutionary algorithms, so genetic, genetic algorithms, in the, situa in the situations where it's impossible, very hard to have an analytical derivative of your loss function. So you know, all these, I mean, the choice of different uh, techniques, it depends a lot on the problem and the model that you are using. In order to avoid overlearning and decide what is the best capacity for, for our problem, uh, you usually, we usually split the data into two sets. So you have the training set and you have a test set, okay? So in the case, for example, again, I have my data distributed, I split my data into training set and this training will give me a loss function, a number. But if I really want, would like to understand how is its power for generalization, I have to look at the test set. Okay, so this is the first step that we, we have to, to think when, when implementing a machine learning system. Why? Because if you look at this plot, in this plot I'm showing the error function for, in, uh, in blue, the training error, and in green for the generalization error versus the capacity. So if you take a model which is very small, so closer to zero, the errors are big for both training and generalization. But as soon as you increase capacity, you see that the training error goes down, goes very closer to zero, while the general, generalization error goes up. So our model is doing very well in the training set, but is losing its generalization power uh, for the test set. Yeah? So we have, in practice, we have to decide and find the red 
vertical line, which is the optimal capacity for my model. In this, in, it's a situation where both errors are in a equilibrium, right? And this is one of the most important trade-offs, so it's called the bias variance trade-off. Because you can uh, have a system with a high bias, and here you have a, a sort of erroneous assumption about uh, the learning algorithm, so you are merely making a mistake in deciding the, the, the capacity. And you have the opposite situation, which is dominated by the high variance at large, at, you see, a large capacity. And in this situation, you get overfitting. And you have, in this case, an erroneous sensitivity to small fluctuations. So you are learning the noise right, with your flexibility. Yeah, so that's the, the, the bias variance trade-off. And the solution for this issue, which is, again, you understand, I, I'm trying to, to tell you that, okay, you can have idea, I take a model, I take an optimizer, a cost function, I have my data, I try to put everything together, and I perform on my fit. But in practice, it's much more than that, because you have to find a way to, generate, to have a model which makes sense. For example, if I go to the hospital, and I have a lot of X-ray images, I would like to train a classifier for that image, for a specific pathology. The images are very huge, so my models will be automatically huge. So if I don't have enough material, enough data, my models will automatically overfit all the images that are feeding. Okay? So to avoid that, I have to apply uh, splitting the data, so considering a training set, a validation set, and a test set. So I use the training and validation to tune the model, and the test set to measure the generalization power of my model. So if I do that, I can uh, believe that my model is good for my, uh, my problem. Okay. And this in practice means that I have to perform a lot of feeds. As soon as I have an algorithm, I have to perform a grid search in a cluster where uh, you try different combinations of parameters, model sizes, optimizers, and each one will take a cross-validation, apply the test uh, set performance uh, measurement, and they use this information to pick up the best model. Okay. So I have this pipeline which is always, always the same. Okay, and now let's just go quickly through artificial neural networks just to remember what they are and why we should, why they are considered today one of the best architectures for, for these kind of applications. Uh, well, first question is why nonlinear models everywhere? No? Well, if you take a picture, like an image, uh, for example, this number one, hidden by hand from the Minis data set, the matrix representation of this number is very huge. So we have a 28 by 28 pixels. So we have a 785 features. And if the picture has colors, then we multiply by three. You have three channels. If you think about solving this system in, uh, using a quadratic function, it will take forever. It will be very non-optimized. You need a lot of memory. It will not be easy to solve this. So you cannot use linear models for pictures. Okay? It's really complicated. So the solution is try non-linear models. They can, uh, store more information about your, about your data set. So here you have a, historically the evolution of uh, the nonlinear models. So everything started in the, the 43, with the first paper about a neuro, neural networks, and I have in, in red the hero of artificial intelligence. So you have papers, theoretical papers, until the 74 with uh, backpropagation, which is the technique to train neural networks. After backpropagation, we switch to the green uh, papers, and in these green papers, people start creating models. So you have Boston machines, multi-layer perceptrons, recursive neural networks, LSTMs. And then finally, in this last decade, we got the deep models. So people start using more and more parameters inside and manage to train the systems without all the issues that we have discussed before. Okay. So as you see, there are a lot of progress and a lot of different models that can be tried and used in, a, in for, for specific problems. The idea of artificial neural networks starts from biology, and is very trivial. Uh, you have uh, the connection between uh, neurons, and the idea is that the information feeds in a neuron and is propagated to a second uh, neuron. More clearly, I mean, you have an input. The input goes inside the dendrite, Inside of the nucleus, you have a logical unit that makes some computation, and then it sends the information into the axon through the terminal, no? to the output terminal. 
Yeah, so this is the biological justification from a mathematical point, it's quite simple. We have inputs and we have a kernel where we apply a nonlinear function, okay? So I have x1, x2, x3, these are the inputs. Then these inputs are multiplied by the arrows, which are weights, so I have a w1, w2, and w3. This information goes inside the next function, which is the sum over the inputs, and we apply this value inside the nonlinear function. Here in the bottom, you see a couple of nonlinear functions. So you have the sigmoid, you have the hyperbolic tangent, or eventually, if you wish, you can also plug linear model. So you have the freedom to select different uh, activation functions. And after doing this computation, you get your outputs. Now, the idea of neural networks to combine a neuron with many neurons, and then you get a system like that. For example, this is a three-layer net with an input containing three nodes. A hidden layer in the middle with two, three nodes again, and an output layer with only one node. Okay. So in all these steps, you have a connection matrices, the Ws, Ij, and you have an activation function, A, so A1, A2, A3, that you take the information from the previous layer. Now, when you compute it, it's trivial, it's a linear algebra, so you have just to evaluate uh, the A1, A2, and 3 by applying the nonlinear activation function to the linear combination of weights and input nodes. Yeah. So you have just a linear product. And finally, you get your answer by doing the forward pass through your neural network. Uh, yes? So what's the function that takes the next function with W, 1, 0, without any input to apply to it? Yeah, it's the bias. It's the bias. Usually, yes, yes, yeah, here. Yeah, usually, just to have... Um, because otherwise it's just a simple linear model, so you have a linear model plus a bias, which is a... The bias is like another input. Yes, yes, yeah, is the, you see the x0 bias there, yeah, that enters the system. It's a parameter of the net, no? You have two tune together. And then, uh, by doing that, you can build several systems, and there are several names for all that. No? You can call feed-forward neural network, the examples that we just saw before. You have a system where it connects layers with layers. We have a multi-layer perceptron if there are more than, um, than three layers, at least three layers. And finally, you have a deep neural networks if the number of layers is high. For example, this one is a deep neural network. You have uh, uh, three hidden uh, layers and uh, two uh, external layers, right? And a lot of weights. Now, each line represents uh, a weight to be tuned by the model, by the optimization problem that you have. But this is just a simple example. In the, in, in the past five, five, six years, we had a lot of progress and people tried systems which are much more complicated, like the recurrent neural network. So you can uh, interconnect nodes in the same layer. So you can make information propagate and be cyclic inside the net. So you can uh, reuse information. If there are correlations or if there are, for example, time dependency, these systems are very, very important and robust because they can uh, reuse information. So recurrent are one of the examples, uh, we have a convolutional neural networks. So nets which are specialized in uh, uh, taking data that usually comes into the picture format and uh, applying scaling, simplifying. So you see here you have a convolutional neural network with several layers, but at the end of, the, of this pipeline, I have just uh, two nodes. No? So for example, saying uh, it's a classification, is it a robot or not, true or false. What all these uh, layers are doing is just a filtering process. So they, they, they try to understand what is going on in the in the image and simplify the output until arriving to the fully connected the, the, um, the last layer and give you an answer. Uh, so it's a sort of a filtering mechanism. And finally, we have GANs, which are generative adversarial networks, are systems where you have two nets. One is a discriminator. So for example, if I send these images, hand uh, written images. I try to, to understand if these images are real or fake. So I have a neural network in, uh, in red, which makes a discriminator and, and, and tell me if it's real or fake. And at the same time, I train another neural network to generate fake images, okay? So I'm trying to make the discriminator very bad. So I try to make something that is able to generate very realistic images you know, in order to, to, to destroy the discriminator uh, accuracy. And these models are quite important, in particular for experimental physics, because we can generate artificial events 
in particle collisions by training a generator. You can uh, create sampling by using a generator. Huh? So, and so on and so forth. It depends on the optimizer, but usually what you do is that you try to move all, all possible weights. Mm -hmm. In one pass, you can move many weights at the same time. Okay. Depends if you, for example, decided to go for a genetic optimizer, then you can select a subset of weights or you can tune it in a proper way. If you use a stochastic gradient descent, then you move all parameters together right? with a different speed. But I mean, the speed and all that will be automatically determined by the optimizer. Yeah, and then you have a long list of uh, other applications like a recursive, long, uh, short-term memory nets, I mean, and boson machines. So really, we have a zoology of uh, nets, which depends a lot on the problem, the specific problem that you are looking for. Okay, now we go for the second uh, part of the talk, applications in, uh, in physics. And uh, before, okay, one of the most interesting applications that I have today is a uh, part on distribution functions. In, uh, in high energy physics. But going here, I decided to show you how can we build a model from theoretical physics. Yeah. So, uh, so far I have explained what uh, computer science guys they did in order to create models that we use. Now I'm trying to do the opposite. I try to take a physical system and convert this physical system into a trainable model. And they, why I did it? Because uh, you know one of the problems that uh, usually we have is Probability density estimation, high dimension probability density estimation, PDF, so PDF sampling. So how can we sample from that? Uh, many times you'd like to have probability functions which are normalized by definition. So you don't want to integrate it or find a normalization for that. And the third point is that you'd like to have a very flexible systems without few parameters. Yeah. So this is my my idea, no? the idea that we started this project. And going always from physics to, to machine learning models. So one possible way to, to think about uh, I mean, to solve this issue is to consider Boson models. So you have a Boson machine here. It's a specific uh, uh, neural network architecture con which contains just uh, two layers. An input layer in blue. So in the blue you have the information which enters the model. And in, red, in uh, yellow you have the hidden layer. So the hidden layer is just, uh, let's say, a, a logic system for this, for this network. And you have the Ws and the connections between all of them. So this is called a visible sector. The yellow one is the hidden sector. The nodes, usually they take binary valued states. This is following the paper from, uh, from Hilton in 86. And you have the connect connection matrices, so the objects that hold the parameters of my Boson machine are called Q, W, and T. Uh, people call Boson machine if uh, T and Q and all the other parameters are different from zero. So this is the general Boson machine. But uh, it's very hard to train the system, so people decided to go through restricted Boson machines, which has particular case where the connections T and Q, so the self-connections in the visible and in the hidden unit are zero. So you don't have interconnections. So have just the W matrix. Okay, why this system is interesting for, for physics? Because you can view it as a statistical system. So you can write an energy function for that system. It's an energy system. Uh, for example, the energy will take the state of vectors for the visible and the hidden unit. And this quantity will be identical to a summation over, you have a kinetic energy, which depends on T and Q. And W, B, v, BH, and BV are the biases. No? So you have this, is, this energy associated to a specific statistical mechanic system. Yeah, so interesting. I can associate energy. But then, is, this is nice because I can uh, compute the partition function of the system. No? So I can uh, have a dz function, which is the summation of, over the exponential of minus energy. And if I compute the probability for the system, yes? So yeah. how do you distinguish between the, say, the T term and the W, ah, oh no, sorry, W is Q. Yeah, w okay, so, uh, 
And then is there an assumption for this kinetic term that they should be positive for something? Yes, like there is, there is. There is a condition which is you can build a matrix with T, Q, W, W transposes, symmetric matrix, and this matrix must be positive defined. Yeah. So this is the only constraint, which makes uh, the training a little bit more complicated than usual, but uh, is the only quantity that you, you have to preserve. So following this pattern, you can build the probability, you can compute the probability as a exponential of energy over the partition function. And after marginalization, you get the PV, so the probability of observing the input information of your system. Okay. Now, this is important because, okay, now I have a system with many parameters. So in principle, if I train these parameters, I can find the probability with a closed form in principle. Okay. So I don't have to, uh, let's say, simplify it, but it's really the closed form. And uh, how to make it uh, real, realistic? Well, you can first mm, take the system and modify the input node. So now you can take uh, real numbers in the visible sector and real numbers in the hidden sector. And if you do that, the PV function will be just a multivariate Gaussian. Okay. Now, I don't want to use a multivariate Gaussian because it's much easier to use just them. Uh, I don't need the, all this complication to make it uh, happen. But if I decided to change the domain of the hidden units to Z, so if I pl apply a, quanti a quantization of the Z units, then something happens and I get this formula for the PV. What I have here, I have a normalization coefficient, this is a square root, I have a, a, a multi-gaussian, and I have the ratio of the Riemann theta function, okay? Now, try to understand better what is this. So I have a, I have a Gaussian, which is a dumping factor, and a ratio between two Riemann theta functions. Now, the Riemann theta functions, if you are, I mean, string theories, or if you, if you remember, uh, the heat equations and uh, all this part of physics uh, is a function very famous where you do the summation over Z by uh, applying the exponential of this dot product. And it has a lot of nice properties like periodicity, modular invariance. It has also, uh, is the solution of the heat equation. And you can compute the gradients. Uh, so you can eventually use this information to train your model. And here we go for the applications. So. You can do many things, and like probability determination, probability sampling, conditional probability, and I go one by one and show you how th these things work. So probability determination. So yeah. Yes. Uh, if you take the system here, and you quantize Z, right? You take the Z hidden unit here. You can compute the energy, and then the free energy of the system with the quantization that you have in the hidden unit. By doing that, you, you discover that inside of the PV formula, there are the ratio of the summation of the hidden states. So you get the theta function. So is this thing or something like that? Or can yes, yes. The fact that you have, um, you, you are in a subspace uh, in Z, is um, let's say a, a infinite state system. So you have an infinite state, state system that can be uh, represented by the summation. Now, applications. If you just take the previous formula of PV and you try to plot it for a couple of uh, parameters, you see how powerful it is, at least in one dimension, just to make you make it more clear, specific. You can take shapes which are very close to Gaussian, but very far from Gaussian, okay? And with a very few number of parameters, uh, talking about here three parameters, and you can get all that out of the box. Uh, you can also do something a little bit more complicated, you can combine both Riemann theta Boseman machines together. So instead of just using one, I put a lot of them, for example, three. And this will increase even f further the model flexibility. And here you have examples where in blue, I have a, a toy underlying PDF. From this toy underlying PDF, I generate a sampling, which is the gray histogram. And then I fit my uh, Riemann theta Boseman machine trying to find the best parameters, and I get the red curve, okay? So you see from a Cauchy distribution, gamma distribution, plateau, and also in some examples in, in two dimensions, with a very small number of, um, of, of parameters, which are quoted uh, in, in the bottom, I can get really well regions like heavy tails, uh, also the behavior of the peak and the shifts. Yeah. 
And this is something that is very hard to get with standard neural networks or with standard models. In particular, this, um, the, all these models, they come with um, normalization built in. And so it, it, all that is automatically normalized for the multi-dimension. So then the, the next, que next question is, is it possible, for example, to, if you have the probability, generate sampling from that probability? And the answer is yes, I can, because I have everything analytically. So I can write my PV as the product of a conditional probability and the hidden probability, and use the, pro the important sampling by looking at first PEH, so the discrete space, and then take this information and apply into the conditional probability and do the important sampling there. Right, so you do this two-step sampling. So it's possible, you can base it, it's a little bit complicated, there are a lot of technical details in the middle, but if you do that, you get these results. So you have your model in a red, and you do sampling and you get the gray histogram, which is really matching the distribution. Yeah. And it's a very fast and very robust way to, 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 to generate samplings. And here, these, these examples, they have been applied to a couple of Monte Carlo integrals and also from financial, financial data. So they are able to reproduce the <coughs> real life examples. And finally, uh, well, a couple of properties like uh, uh, affine transformation, so this model, supports the possibility to rotate and scale without retraining. So if you just change, apply rotations to the parameters, you can really start from a situation in the left and automatically rotate it and scale by preserving not only the shape, but also the sampling. Also conditional probabilities are possible, so you can compute it analytically. And again, you have another expression for, the, for these conditions. And you see, to, in examples in 2D, that uh, by doing these slices, you get the blue histogram, the blue model, and the empirical histogram, which are matching quite well. Okay. And the time to make all these computations is very, very fast, because you don't have any particular or complicated function to, to evaluate. Again, this example on the left has been uh, obtained from a Monte Carlo matrix element that we have uh, in, uh, in MatGraph. So you can really try and find the, the, the conditions. And finally, the last example, how to apply it, is uh, you can take the Boson machine and you can uh, evaluate the expectation for the hidden unit based on what you see in the, in the input. So you have expectation of HI for V, and you see that it's just the gradient of the riemann dieter bose machine. And by taking, for example, an exa uh, this example of uh, image classification, I can build a system where uh, there is a layer of uh, riemann dieter bose machines that will filter the information and project this information into a feature vector. And this feature vector will go inside the classifier. So just to give you Num some numbers. If you do a classification of jet images without any preprocessing, uh, by using logistic regression, you get a precision of 77%. But if you apply this procedure with the Riemann Tita Bosa machine, you can increase out of the box from 77 to 83. Yeah? By without doing any particular fine tuning, just plugging the preprocessing. Yeah? And the last example for, for this particular model consists in attaching Boson machines uh, uh, one after the other in a sequential model. So you can take uh, several systems and put one after the other. And uh, this kind of architecture is quite useful for fitting pe periodic functions. So if I show you this left plot with this noisy data, but periodic, I can then try to fit this data using this system and I get the results in the center here. So the TNN fit. And thanks to the periodicity of the riemann tita function and, uh, and the model itself, you can reproduce all the oscillations along all the, all the axes. And so you can have some forecast predictions based on, uh, on periodicity. Okay, so this closes now the, the chapter of how we can, in physics, uh, propagate our models into, into machine learning. And now we can go just uh, briefly uh, looking at a couple of examples in high energy physics uh, where we use machine learning. So, parton density functions. Uh, in the 69, Feynman uh, has introduced the parton model. So the idea was to understand how the quarks and gluons are characterized by uh, a probability density function uh, of 
its nuclear momentum. So you have the protons or the uh, neutrons. You'd like to understand in a, um, in a particle collision how quarks and uh, gluons they behave and how much uh, energy they carry after or during the collision. And he has proposed this parto model. Uh, the parto model, the idea behind it is that you take a lepton, you send the lepton into a hadron, and the interaction between the photon and the, and the, um, uh, the parto, which is a quark or gluon, will tell you how, uh, what's the fraction of uh, energy momentum that they are carrying on. Uh, so usually you have a system like this for deep inelastic in scattering, and you would like to understand what is the momentum fraction of the quark, so PQ plus Q. Uh, we define X as the momentum fraction uh, fixed by the final state kinematics. So it's how much of the proton initial energy is in, the, in, in your parton. And uh, usually you see that all cross-sections that we compute in, uh, in our predictions, they require a PDF. So you need a PDF to make a this calculation. Then uh, after, after the contribution of many people that you see on the, on the left, uh, the part of model was improved, and thanks to the perturbative expansions, and the part of model is considered as sort of a first order approximation to the real uh, QCD or perturbative expansion. And there are some features which are PDFs are not calculable, so I cannot compute them from basic principles. Uh, there is a factorization theorem that can guarantee guarantees the possibility to compute any any kind of um, at least. Uh, hadronic processes by using PDFs, where I, I multiply, I do the convolution between the hard cross-section, like the Feynman diagrams, with the parton distribution function. And everything was proved through OPE, so operated product expansion, using the Wilson expansions, okay? So if you look at the late C, we have a Drellian, so a collision between uh, two protons, and then you have an interaction of quarks and gluons inside of these protons. But uh, you have also the possibility to you look at a deep inelastic scattering on the right. And again, in both cases, you use PDFs and you use the factorization theorem. Okay. Now, the main problem is that as you cannot compute PDFs, you have to extract PDFs by comparing our theoretical computations with data. Why this is necessary? Because if you think like uh, uh, some years ago with the Higgs discovery, uh, in order to make the yellow and blue, uh, yellow and green band, uh, you need PDFs. You need precise PDFs. You know? Accuracy of these, these quantities are really relevant because otherwise you don't know where your predictions will be in the graph. So you, you need this scaling to tune and have the, the predictions. So it's absolutely necessary for signal background uh, detection. But if you, for example, open the CERN yellow report from 2016, you see that for many Higgs production channels, the PDF uncertainty, so these plots are showing for different channels, the total percentage of uncertainty. And you see that in blue, the PDF plus alpha strong uncertainty is large for many channels. Okay. And in many cases, it's also larger than the scale uncertainty, which are the two big uncertainties that we have in, in our computations. So Finding the best set of PDFs is important, but it's also important to reduce uncertainties and have a very good estimate of uncertainties. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the past, what happened in historically, everything started in the 84, and PDFs, the shape of PDFs were something like you see, what you see on the left plot. So just the central values, very naive models, based on few data points, in particular from the D0 experiment. Then if you plot on the right side the gluon PDF for different years, so you have a 94, 99, 2000, you see how all these curves, they change. So you have a completely different solutions based on the year and on the data set. So it's a completely, it's, it's a very complicated thing. So you don't know what is the best solution. They change a lot. So what you can do? How can you improve that? Well, you can try to find a methodology. You can try to, to use, for example, machine learning to improve the situation. And this is the state of the art that we have today where you see all the flavors at the two different scales, at the LHC scale on the left and at the uh, future CC, so FCC on the right. And these PDFs are now for many flavors and they have uncertainty bands on it. So you can estimate the uncertainty. Uh, and this is what we call today, so this is a set of PDF, is called an NNPDF, so neural network P 
PDFs. And it's, this project started 10 years ago, okay, trying to use machine learning to estimate PDFs in order to, to get uh, predictions which make sense. Okay. Uh, from uh, just a very simple machine learning point of view and also physics, uh, in, the, in case of Drellian, we are computing our observable sigma x as the convolution between a hard cross section sigma hat multiplied by PDF twice. So you have a PDF FA and FB for two different flavors in, a, in terms of x and the energy. So from an optimization point of view, we would like to discover what is the shape of f after this convolution. And we can use all available data, because thanks to the factorization theorem, we can use really everything that was measured before. So you have a 500, uh, uh, 5,000 data points from many experiments, from, from LHC, from LAP, from the previous ones. And this covers almost everything that you have. Yeah. So are you not using the variable Yes, yes, we are, we are. Just two are. Yes, 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 absolutely. So Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then you run the Absolutely, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, this simplifies a lot because otherwise we have uh, this uh, double dependency in X and Q, and it will be much more complicated. Yeah. Moreover, just a comment about the data. Yes, we have 5,000 points, but uh, data has have been collected in the last 30 years, so it's quite possible to find the data inconsistencies. So you have to fight with that. So you have to press select and understand if the data makes sense, or if there are bugs, or if there are yeah, lack of information. Uh, in this approach, what we do? We would like to at least uh, solve two issues. The first is deciding the shape of the PDFs. No? You can use a polynomial, you could use um, a model, a simple model, but we decided to go for a neural network because it's in some sense bias free. So you don't make any assumption about the model. And the second difficulty is uh, how to estimate uncertainties because you can make a fit to the central values of all these data points, but you don't have an uncertainty estimate. So for that, we have developed a Monte Carlo artificial replica generator. So you take the, the data points and you create a replicas of these data points. And for each replica, you perform a fit. At the end of the day, you have several replicas and averaging these replicas, you can compute the uncertainty. And we'll show you this in the, in the next slides. So the data, this is the data that you have as a function of x and q square. So you see that we cover the x uh, domain from close to 10 to the minus five to one. And the Q squared domain goes from very few GVs to very high GVs. So you have a, a DIS experiments on the bottom and a LHC experiments on the top. Yeah. And thanks to DGLAP, we can solve and fit everything at an initial scale. Yeah. Uh, in, in, overall, in overall, we can consider seven physical processes from uh, f 14 experiments yeah, uh, that have been collected in these 30 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the problem is that uh, for um, the quality, the, the theory, based on the theory that you use, so if you use it next to leading or next to next, you sometimes have to drop data. For example, jets. If you take the jets, jets that are next to leading order, the predictions are available. So you can make it. So you can use all the available data. But at a next to next leading order, last year they published finally a Monte Carlo that is able to do it. But, for example, for this release, it was not possible, so you have to drop this data out. And then you reduce the, the size. So we are bounded by, let's say, the, the capacity of the community in, uh, in generating Monte Carlos that covers all the perturbative orders, and they have uh, the data. Yeah. So there's a sort of fight between these two. Also, the convolution equations in Monte Carlos have to be considered. Yes, 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 yes. They are fine, so we can do up to next cube leading order for DGLAP. So the DGLAP is, is not a problem at all. It's fine. The problem is that you need Monte Carlo predictions for all these processes. And uh, the community is still developing. For example, uh, W, if you do W, Z, fine, you have them. Jets, now you have. But there is still systems or particular the, um, observables where you don't have predictions. And you have to draw. Well, obviously, doing, today doing a leading order fit makes no sense because well, nobody use it, but uh, let's say the state of the art is a full next to leading order fit. Yeah, so now we go through the DGLAPs just to exactly explain at this point. Uh, should we use, a, should we model PDFs as in terms of X and Q square? Well, no, because we have a DGLAP and you can simplify by 
including an evolution kernel that will bring down the energy to an initial scale. So I can define a Q0, which is a scale that I, I decide, and then uh, thanks to the DGLAP uh, formalism, I can uh, automatically bring down all predictions to this scale. Yeah. So I simplify the problem by using fx q square into fx q0 square, which means just fx. My problem is a function, several functions, one per flavor, per quark and gluon flavors, and in terms of x, which is the only variable that I have. And there is a second problem that you may, you may ask is, okay, fine, I can have a PDF which depends only on x, but uh, I have to compute uh, predictions. So in principle, I need a Monte Carlo. Yeah? And if I try to modify the PDF and then compute the Monte Carlo, I have to wait two weeks for each data point. So it's infeasible, no? if, you, if, you, if you think. And to solve this issue, we decided to tabulate the matrix elements, so what I call here in this function W, from the Monte Carlo. So you run the Monte Carlo one time, you collect all weights from, v, from Vegas, and then you can uh, rewrite the final cross-section by multiplying these weights to the PDFs. And this convolution here is very fast. So you do a long computation in Monte Carlo, and then you just do in a few microseconds the, um, uh, the product again. Okay. So this is important because otherwise it would be impossible to, um, to make a fit. Uh, we have a couple of other constraints, like momentum sum rules. So PDFs must preserve a couple of properties, like uh, uh, the, 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 one, the integral that you see in the first plot. So the summation of all flavors integrated from 0, 1 must be identity. The difference between the up quark and out quark is 2. The down minus d bar, 1. And for all other flavors, 0. Okay. So these constraints, they must be propagated inside your, your train. You have, your model has to take into consideration. Uh, so in early models, what people did was to find a f, which is just a polynomial, a coefficient a times x to alpha times 1 minus x to the beta. This was what I showed before. And in our case, we use a neural network, so we replace, we multiply, let's say, the polynomial preprocessing to a neural network. And here you use, for each flavor, a, a multilayer perceptron with two input nodes, five in the first hidden unit, three nodes in the second hidden unit, and one output. Uh, we apply sigmoids for all layers. And in overall, if you compute the total number of uh, parameters, I have 296 free parameters. So why did you do this structure? Yeah, because we did a, a grid search, trying to understand what is the best to avoid this generalization error, not to bias overfitting and underfitting. And at the end of the day, we discovered that this particular setup is the most stable. And you see that there is a x and log x. Usually you say, no, this is x, so why you do you need to? Yeah, this happens because it helps a lot in um, freezing the log x, freezes the small x behavior because it's more sensitive by doing the log n, and the x helps in the large x domain. Yeah. And this is really, uh, let's say, boosts the speed of the train. You get the results much faster. And it's the same for quarks and gluons. Exactly, it's the same. So that's, uh, that's interesting because the na um, this means that, let's say, the data we have do not require a lot of flexibility flavor by flavor. No. So you can get something that is a little bit more um, in comparison to a polynomial. Even the quarks and gluons are very different. They are very different, exactly. But we, in this system here, uh, we are talking about uh, 30 parameters per flavor. No? So they are relatively free. No? Uh, you should just be a little bit careful and not boost much, otherwise you get overfit, so you get a lot of wiggles and uh, you, you cannot, if someone delivers a new set of data and you generate theoretical predictions, you don't get a good chi-square. No? So you overfit. So this is for the architecture. Uh, for the loss function, we minimize the chi-square because we have data and experiment, the experimental covariance matrix. So this is standard way to do it. You wait the, the distance between the experimental measure D and our model prediction O by the sigma ij, so the experimental curve mat. And for the data, we use the Monte Carlo artificial replica generator. So we take original data, and for each replica, we apply random Gaussian shifts based on the correlation matrix provided by the experimental uh, analysis. So, this is just to make to make you uh, the, the, 
let's say the idea clear. We generate, for example, 1,000 data replicas using this Monte Carlo approach, and for each data replica, we have a feed. So you generate a PDF feed. You have a curve for that, for all flavors. So if I plot the result, for example, the glue on PDF, I get something like that. So for each Monte Carlo replica, I have my line, so my neural network, and uh, thanks to the Monte Carlo boost, uh, bootstrap method that I use, I can compute the central value and the standard deviation by using the, 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 the mean and the standard deviation over replicas. So you see here, the red dotted line is just the average overall uh, nets. Yeah. Is that like yeah, yeah. So you see that, for example, the gluon, even this gluon is from 2.3, so we did not include a lot of jet data. And uh, the uncertainty at small x are big, are big. Mm. While, for example, in the region between 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 1, you get a very smooth distribution. Yeah, yeah. and then I can show you uh, the impact of doing that in these ways. For example, I can compare the measurements. For example, you here on the left, you have the w plus, w minus. So in blue, you have the, pre the experimental prediction and the PDF predictions for us, which is an NPDF 3.1, the latest release, and for the others. So you see that uh, in overall for W, for W, for the Z bosom, uh, you get always a very good agreement with experimental data, right, by doing that. And just trying to remember, so what's mm. the value of the typical value of X for W? Yeah, for this one, uh, yeah, this one we, we yeah, ah, did you use a roundup? Three to minus three until let's say depend on which is well can I have it here? Oh. No, is the no? Yeah, it's three minus three. Yeah, I can I can show you later. But yeah, depends on uh, on uh, is here. Yeah, it's here. So fixed reliance. So is the blue. Now you can put, for example, the, all the magenta dots. So for, yeah, let's say in practice from 10 to the minus two to one. Right. But this is not that much data below 10 yeah. to the minus yeah. four. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because we have predictions for below 10 to the minus four. Yeah, right. exactly. So you have to rely on this uh, extrapolation. Right. Right. And this is, that's why, let's say, using a machine learning approach is, if you apply the generalization, is good, because then you know that the same gluon that uh, is uh, able to reproduce uh, DIS works for the, the other parts. But if you start using polynomials, then you are locking by definition your bias in by your assumption. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, just another example for Higgs production again. Here we don't have an uh, uncertainty bandwidth, but you see that again, the quality is acceptable. So you get the predictions with uncertainty error bars and so on. Yeah, so I don't know if I have much time, but. Uh, can just show a couple of exam examples quickly. How, how long do you need? Uh, no, I think uh, five, ten minutes maximum. Five, five, five is fine. Yeah, yeah. So PDFs are important, as you say, as you saw before. It's used every every time, every every day. We we make theoretical predictions, but it's possible to find other applications like uh, in jet physics. Uh, there is a particular problem in uh, at LHC, is when you your system is boosted. So it means that the PT of your particle, of your jet, is too large in comparison to its mass. You get a jet, and usually you don't see the two jets, now the dijet distribution. As they are very boosted, you get one single jet in one direction. And then when this happens, is the situation on the right, you don't know if it's a quark or gluon jet or a W, Z, or Higgs jet. It's ambiguous, no? You don't know how to do it. So what people in the theory does is they apply a grooming algorithm to take the tree of your jet and drop the branches by selecting, for example, soft branches or branches with a wide angle. So you try to prune this thing and get something that makes more sense, avoid all the noise or the non-perturbative effects from, from this jet's clustering. So what do we try to to, to to modify or to implement is a method where you use a reinforcement learning, so the video game uh, procedure, to uh, learn how to do these cuts. So if I, if I receive, if you receive this tree uh, of events, of a jet event, uh, you see in red 
the branches that have to be cut in order to obtain a good jet. So understand if the jet is from a, a W or Higgs or whatever. So we train as a neural network, a deep Q network, to understand if the situation, is, which branches they should, should be cut, which branches should not. No? And here you have a transition from the left to the right. And the reward, let's say the, the, the score of the video game, is to check the invariant mass distribution of the jet. So the idea is I create a deep Q network, I connect this deep Q network, uh, the possibility to cut branches, and I define a Q function which is controlled by my neural network. So depending on how the cuts are performed, the Q value will be high or low. And he, this, uh, this agent should learn how to cut it after some, uh, some training. And here you have the examples. So in, uh, let's see the central plot first. In the central plot, you have the blue distribution, which is the invariant mass of many jets without grooming. So just taking all, all the three cascades of particles. So you see, there is nothing particularly interesting. It's very flat, the, the, the peak is very broad. So you don't know which particle it is. But after applying the grooming using this deep Q network, you generate, so you, you polish this distribution and you get the green distribution, which is centered around the W mass. So he managed to discover a way to filter and cut all soft and wide angle branches and improve and boost the, the invariant mass. So now I'm sure that I'm working with a W3 event. No, so I have, yes, yes. So you see, for example, this is particularly interesting for the W, so this model is for the W, but if you check the QCD jets, again, he reduces background noise. So in blue, you have the ungroomed, and in green, you have the groomed one. And the most interesting feature is that uh, as the agent learns how to play this game, if you change the data and use, for example, top data, so you, you take the groomer from W and apply it to top data, he's still able to, to find the top peak. No? So that if, one both the top and the top you exactly. are, are merged together. Exactly, in the same. exactly. But the, the, the net never saw before the top data. So it was completely, uh, she don't, doesn't know anything about the top. She knows how to reconstruct very well the W, but not the, the top. But still, he's able to, so in some sense, there is a, a inner property of the system that can be learned and is it systematic can be applied to, to, to different families of jets. Yeah. So this is a, well, just a recent paper that we did a, a couple of weeks ago. So it's possible to use a reinforcement learning in this con at least in this kind of set special setup where you have a target object that you would like to reproduce, and that's it. Yeah, so this is the for jets. And finally, a uh, last example about how to use machine learning Monte Carlo simulation. Well, it's possible to try to <clears throat> correct, so try to propagate higher order corrections to matrix elements by modifying the Sudakov form factor and replacing the Sudakov form factor with a neural network. So this is also possible to do. So you can comp use, um, uh, implement a reweighting strategy where you'd like to propagate, for example, uh, next to leading order corrections to a leading order event by tuning the Sudakov form factor. So in this procedure, we use the Milo, powag milo implementation, and we have replaced the delta, which is the Sudakov, with a neural network. Yeah. And by doing that, uh, you get a, a, a numerical Sudakov for that system. And here on the right plot, you see the, um, uh, for example, before it was the green, the ratio plot, so the first inset for the, dub, for the top quark transit momentum. Uh, you see the green and the blue, they were different. But after tuning the Sudakov, you get the red curve, which is flat and very similar to what you'd like to get in terms of um, perturbative expansion. So just a, just a quick example to show you that uh, we can also try to modify the reweighting and the structure of the Sudakov inside the, the, the system to match all missing corrections that we would like to get. So we don't have to really compute everything, but you can approximate with a neural network. Yeah, so that's it, thank you. Thank you, Stefano. Do you have any questions? 
Are there any other methods that you can, I assume not everybody's doing machine learning. Is there some other method you can compare with? You mean in this field or in? Yeah. For, for example, for this particle physics application. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For example, we are doing now a couple of, uh, we're trying to use generative models for, for example, Monte Carlo integration, which is something that would, would improve a lot uh, the times that you have to wait when doing simulation. And uh, also, for example, in PDFs, we are trying deep models try to improve what I have shown so far with uh, systems which are more robust, more f faster to train. And, I'm asking uh, a different question. I'm asking yes. is, are there groups that aren't doing machine learning ah, that they're yeah. producing comparable results? Yeah, yeah, they, they are trying. They're trying. But this yeah, situation, but we have the beginning. Yes. For, for PDF, there are different groups. That yeah, but nobody uses machine learning. Yeah. No, for the that. Only one I understand, but it would be nice to compare the results to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are they comparable? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I didn't want to, to talk much about, but for example, here you have all the competitors. Yeah. You see that we, we win almost all the, in comparison to the real data, we win. Yeah. And you have also smaller uncertainty. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, we have at CERN every, I think, six months a meeting uh, where, uh, called a PDF for LHC, where there is a fight, nice fight. Uh, and everybody discusses about uh, what's going on. Any more questions? All right. Okay, so I think we can thank uh, Stefano and uh, I, I think there should be refreshments upstairs. <laughs>